but the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free from the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine and fill this land with the father's glory place spirit place set our hearts on fire a flow a river flow a flood the nations with grace and mercy send forth your word lord and let there be light lord i come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance by the blood i may enter your brightness search me try me consume all my darkness shine on me shine on me shine in jesus shine and fill this land with the father's glory place a spirit place set our hearts on fire a flow a river flow a flood the nations with grace and mercy send forth your word a lord and let there be light in christ alone as we prepare for our communion in christ alone In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is the light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, and here in the death of Christ I live. And there in the ground, his body laid, light of the darkness slain, and then bursting forth in up from the grave, he rose again, and as he in since lost his grip on me, for I am and 
kingdom brought with the precious blood of Christ. Ain't no guilt in life, and no fear in death. This is the of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus destiny, no power of no sin can meet his hand until he turns or home here in the of Christ I stand no power of no scheme of man can ever pluck me hand until he returns or me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Today we're going to celebrate two feasts. Have an opportunity twice today. The second time is in honor of our very, very good, loving brother David, uh, who's departing our little circle of influence. He's traveling somewhere far out west, uncharted territory. <laughs> He's got his ax and his apple seeds. He's going to be doing reclamation of the great frontier. And as I was thinking about coming up here, I was thinking how the two feasts we're going to share today are really quite similar when you think about it, really. Uh, we're saying goodbye to someone that has been uh, very much in our hearts, uh, someone that we love very much, much like the apostles when they were having the last meal with Christ, when they were saying their goodbyes to him because he was going off unto a pursuit of his own. The second thing is, we're saying goodbye to somebody who's done so much for us, uh, who has influenced us quite a bit. Now, David, that's not meant to elevate you to the presence of our Lord. You're way down here, you know that. <laughs> way down here. But the third thing I think is most important of all is that in both cases, we're going to see him again. Amen. We're going to see him again. Maybe David will come scooting by with his motorcycle one day and say hello to us, but if we never see him again on this earth, we are rest assured Amen. that we're going to see him again in heaven. Uh, and there's where the similarity with our Lord is. We know we're going to see our Lord again, as long as we do our part. He has done his part. Now it's up to us to continue to fight to continue to strive, to continue to live the lives that we need to live in order to see him again. So as the apostle said, God speed to the Lord, we say God speed to David. Please bow with me. Father, as we commemorate the last supper that your son had with those that he loved so much on this earth, and as he met with them and as he memorialized that meeting by offering them the bread, uh, offering them the fruit of the vine, uh, and gave them a celebration uh, of remembrance of him. So that every time they took uh, the loaf of bread and every time they took uh, the fruit of the vine, they were doing it in the solemn remembrance of the love that he had for them, the love that he, they had for him, for all the things that he had done for them, the teaching, the love, the instruction, and also for the fact that they were going to see him again, and he knew that. And that's why, Father, 
we strive to be your children so that we too uh, can uh, attain life everlasting with your son. And now as we prepare ourselves, Father, to take uh, the loaf, uh, we pray, Father, that taking the nourishment in the form uh, and the resemblance of your son's body, uh, as he told us to do, and, and he imparts into us his spirit. We're so thankful. We pray that we can do it in a way that is loving uh, and intended to be uh, taken by you. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity, uh, and we, we know that your blessing is gathering as we take this meal. <clears throat> In his holy name we pray, amen. That portion of the meal <coughs> having been completed, the Lord then passed the fruit of the vine about. And he told the disciples and asked his disciples that every time uh, they took the fruit of the vine in the setting that they were in, as we are in right now, uh, that they and that we do it in complete remembrance of him. So as we now partake of the fruit of the vine, it is with a distinct reverence for the sacrifice that the Lord made for us. In his holy name we pray, amen. The best part about being a Christian, about being a believer, is all the wonderful things we receive from the Lord in a form of blessings, in the form of protections, in a form of everything that we need. Second part of that is having received all of these blessings, it's our obligation to share what we've received to assist those that perhaps haven't received as much as we have received. And that's why we have outreach programs with the church, trying to help those <clears throat> more impoverished than us. That's part of our duty, it's part of our obligation. So as we prepare to do that, to share what the Lord has given to us, let us bow and pray. Father, we're so thankful for all that you've given to us. We have been blessed beyond measure. The things that you have allowed us to have, to obtain, the lives you've allowed us to live <clears throat> has enhanced our existence on this earth. We pray, Father, that as we turn a portion of what you've allowed us to accumulate, we do so in a giving and loving manner because we know that <clears throat> not only is it good for us to receive, but it is better for us to give. We pray, Father, we do it in a way that is pleasing to you and we pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Brothers, follow me. We start. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name 
Your name is strength. Your name is power. A strong tower makes me safe. Say, oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. Your name is strength. Your name is power. Good sisters. A strong tower makes me safe. One more time. Brothers, oh, Lord. Sister, repeat. Ah, Lord. Ah. How excellent. How excellent is your name. Your name is Your name is strength. Your name is power. Good job. Your strong town makes me. We'll do it one more time. Say, oh, sister, repeat. Oh, ah, Lord, ah, Lord, how Good, good, good. Your name is strength. That's good. Your name is power. A strong tower makes me say. And was taken oh, 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 nobody, Lord, nobody like you, Lord, was taken oh, 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 nobody, Lord, nobody, nobody like you, Lord. We're crying, oh, say, oh, 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 nobody, nobody, nobody like you, Lord. Nobody like you, Lord. Say, oh, now, oh, oh. Oh, Lord, now nobody like you, Lord. There's nobody, nobody like you, Lord. Sing nobody, nobody like you, Lord. Nobody, nobody like you, Lord. Nobody like you. There's nobody, nobody like you, Lord. Nobody like you, Lord. There's nobody, nobody like you, Lord. And nobody like you, Lord. Good morning, Lehigh Valley. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Mark, chapter 6. And we will read from verse number 39 through 34, through 44, sorry. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, uh, beginning verse t- number 39. And he commanded them all to recline by groups on the grass. And they reclined in companies of, one, of hundreds and of fifties. And he took five loaves and two fish. And looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves. And he kept giving them out to the disciples to set before them. And he divided up the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up 12 full baskets of broken pieces and also of the fish. And there were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. End of the reading. May God bless us. Allah's blessing. Let's stand. Let's, if you're able and willing, let's stand for this song. There's a message true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Ring it out, ring it out. 
uh, it will give them courage new. It will help them to be true. Ring it out, ring it out, ring out in the Jesus, many live in sin and die. A ring out in the news that may and then free into all the loss of free nation. Ring it out. Until the world of saving grace make it known in every place. Ring it out. Ring it out. Ring it out. Help the needy ones to know him from whom all blessings flow. Ring it out. Ring it out. Ring it out. In the news that may men free into all the in every nation ring it out ring it out a sin and doubt to sweep away until shall dawn the, the day ring it out ring it out until the sinful world be one for jehovah's mighty son ring it out Ring it out, ring out, and the word, all land and sea, still far from many live and sin and doubt. Ring out in the news that made men free into all the laws of every nation. Ring it out. Amen. Let us all say amen today. How many of you are happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Come on, tell the truth. Shame the devil. Amen. Man, amen. It's such a blessing to be in the house of the Lord one more time to worship and to praise his name. If you are visiting with us, you are, are our honored guests here at the Lehigh Valley Church of Christ. Before you leave today, please fill out one of our visitor's cards so that we can properly thank you for being with us on uh, this morning. Uh, as has been stated, um, uh, we're going to, at the end of service today, uh, we're going to form a prayer circle, uh, and we're going to uh, uh, pray uh, with Dave as he uh, leaves us, and uh, we're going to give him today our blessing. Amen? Uh, and Brother Dave, I want you to know that you mean a lot to me. You have meant a lot to me uh, in this ministry. Uh, this is a giving brother. He's a loving brother. Um, when things needed to be done around here, you can count on Brother Dave to uh, be right there. If he says he's going to do something, uh, you can take it to the bank uh, that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. He's uh, very evangelistic. Uh, he's for winning souls for Jesus. Uh, and so we're going to uh, pray with him uh, that God be with him uh, wherever he goes in his journey. We're just sad that he's leaving, but we know that uh, this is a new journey in his life. Uh, and um, I'm praying that uh, whatever you put your hands to, that God will bless it. Uh, enjoy retirement. Travel the world. Amen. I'll get there soon. Amen. I got a few more years to get there, but, uh, but uh, we're praying for you and with you on today. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 was read into your hearing, um, but I want to go up to verse 35 uh, and come down to verse 38. Mark chapter 6, verse 35, and we're, we will conclude at verse 38. The Bible says, by this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, 
and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, I want you to underline this in your Bible today. You go, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fishes. This is one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. 5,000 hungry men show up uninvited, and then, uh, Brother Anderson, that's not that, it's not enough that they show up uninvited. They want something to eat. Imagine ordering 5,000 uh, deep dish Chicago style pizzas. That would cost a lot of money, wouldn't it? What about 5,000, I'll bring it to Philly, tomato pies, right? Uh, what would you do? The people are tired. They're hungry. Now, I want you to see, this is 5,000 men. It's not counting the women and the children. And history says when you begin to count up the women and the children, there was 10 to 15,000 people there. The local Burger King is closed for remodeling. The nearest Chick-fil-A is in Jerusalem. Pizza Hut don't deliver to the wilderness. So the disciples, they, Brother Larry, they make this suggestion. They said, send them the way, send them away and let them go get their own food. In other words, let them go and feed themselves. That's logical, right? See, the suggestion, I want you to see, it's not made from bad motives. In themselves, the disciples had no resources to meet this enormous need. Listen, they had no food, they had no money, where else could they do? They could do nothing. And one of the disciples came to Jesus that day and asked, where could we go to get enough bread for all these people to eat? And do you know what Jesus said to his disciples? Do you know what Jesus said to the man who has given up so much in order to follow Jesus? He said, Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Uh, excuse me? What if you were one of the disciples of Jesus? What if you had given up much to follow Jesus? What if you had committed your life to following him, to listening to him, and serving him when, wherever he went? What if you were one of the 5,000? What if you were one of them? What if you were one of the 12? What would you do? What, would, what if you came up to Jesus and asked, where are we going to get these people something to eat? Here's what Jesus said to the group. He says, you, you, give them something to eat. And I love it when Jesus says that. He says, you give them something to eat. And it's somewhat funny because the disciples has just gotten through explaining why they can't feed this massive crowd. And one wonders if they were thinking something like this. You want me to feed this crowd? This, the, these 5,000? You got to be kidding me. Didn't you just hear what we just said? We don't have any money. We don't have any food. What we have here, uh, brothers and sisters, is a failure to communicate. But Jesus wouldn't let these men off the hook. He wants them, and this is what he wants from you and me today. He wants them to get involved in the great adventure of helping other people. Me? Me, Jesus? Give them something to eat? I thought Jesus was the great miracle worker. I thought Jesus could fix anything. I thought Jesus could solve any problems. I thought Jesus could change any circumstance. Let's just turn it over to Jesus. After all, isn't that what we sing about on Sunday mornings? Turn it over to Jesus and he'll work it out. Is there anything that we need? Let's turn it over to Jesus. Well, 
There's some truth to that attitude, of course. But Jesus' first response to the disciples surely must have stunned them, Brother Tom. He says, you give them something to eat. Jesus turns to his disciples, to the people who have shown their commitment to him, to his followers, and he says to them, you give them something to eat. That doesn't help the situation at all. Why won't Jesus act immediately? Why won't Jesus do uh, what me or I, a disciple of his, have asked him to do? Why Why did he turn the question over to me? Why does Jesus turn the need over to me? This is how Jesus often works with his followers. Over and over again, he puts us in a situation or in positions where we are helpless. And he says, do something. In our desperation, we cry out to heaven, how am I to do something? I'm out of money. I'm out of resources. I don't know what to do. And then he says, I'm so glad you asked. When you come to the end of your resources and you don't know what to do, this is when Jesus comes in and he says, ow, I can now work with you. It's not that Jesus wants you to fail, but he does want you to know that without him, we can do nothing. Our success in this life as a Christian depends totally upon him. Matthew 19 and 26, but Jesus beheld them and he says to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, what? All things are possible. John accounts of this miracle tells us that it was Andrew who found the young boy with five loaves and two fishes and brought him to Jesus. Now when I say five loaves and two fishes, don't think of Sarah Lee. Amen. Don't think of Wonder Bread. And when I say fish, don't think of perch. Don't think of whiting. Don't think of cod. Amen. I want you to think about crackers and sardines. Amen. And he brought this to him. And we should not miss the obvious lesson here. Don't ever despise the day of small things. Just because something is small. We talk about five barley crackers and two sardines. See, back in the day, Brother Phil, that was was lunch, right? Uh, And just because something is small or seemingly insignificant doesn't mean God can't use it. He used the baby tears to attract uh, Pharaoh's daughter and the infant Moses was saved from uh, a certain death. And later he used Moses' rod to deliver the children of Israel. And later a teenage boy named David used one smooth stone to defeat mighty Goliath. Now, Jesus, he's about to feed 5,000 men with five barley crackers and two sardines. See, size doesn't matter with God. He can use anything we offer him. When you hear this narrative of the feeding of the 5,000, do you imagine that you are one of the 5,000 or you are one of the twelve? At this point, each of us is one of the 5,000. I know that. But at some point, Jesus wants us to uh, leave the 5,000 and become one of the 12. And at this point, you know, he's asking us to do some work for him. And as I stand back and ponder this this wonderful miracle, one truth seems to stand above the rest. If you like. We can call this the moral of the story. God often puts us in situations where we are doomed to failure in order to force us to depend totally on him so that when the miracle is done, we don't get the credit, he gets the credit. See, this is divine strategy repeated many times in the Bible and in my own life. Has something ever happened in your life and and you just thought to yourself, I know in no way possible that I was able to make this possible. I know that it was God. And all you could do is look up to heaven and say, thank you, Lord. 
And we often find ourselves in desperate straits with no way out, no good options, no way of remedying our situation. God allows this to happen so that we will cry out to him and we will ask him for help. As humans, a lot of times we want to do things our way. We want to take the credit. But God says, I will bring you to your knees. I will bring you to the point where you have to look up and say, Lord, help me. And when that deliverance comes, brothers and sisters, we are obligated to give God the total credit. Can I tell you something today? It's a stressful thing to have no money. Amen. It's a stressful thing to have no manpower. Just think about this story. They had no money. They had no resources. Right? No way to meet the needs in front of you. And still Jesus says to these men, these people are hungry. Give them something to eat. The fact is that something is po impossible uh, is no excuse for not trying to do it. All too often we conclude that something can't be done. So what, what, what do we do? We don't bother to do it. If Moses would have taken that attitude, the Jews would still be in Egypt. If Joshua felt that way, the walls of Jericho would still be standing. If David had adopted that opinion, Goliath would still be terrorizing the Israelites. You never know in advance what God may do, so don't rule out the possibility of a miracle coming your way. Amen. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you will need to hear the response from him. Sometimes we have so much noise in our ears that we are not even listening to the voice of God. When you are asking God to feed the hungry, when you are asking God to heal your family, when you are asking God to comfort the sorrowful, when you are asking God to intercede in the world, when you will hear the same response that Jesus gave to his disciples, he says, you. Lehigh Valley, you Lehigh Valley, give them something to eat. Me? Me? Brother Paul? Sister Lisa? Brother Phil? Me? Give them something to eat? You give them something to eat. There are no other arms or legs uh, of Jesus. The arms and legs of Jesus Look in the mirror every day. You are the arms and the legs of Jesus. It's only us. We are the representation of Jesus. Those of us who really do want to follow him. Do you want to follow Jesus today? Do you want to be a disciple of his? So if we recognize this on this morning, it's hard work. It's not just sitting on the hillside and waiting for someone else to come up with the food. Amen. It's not just taking requests up to the chain of commands and waiting for someone else to do something. That's what happens in the church. Oh, Brother Bean will do it. Brother Larry will do it. Brother Phil will do it. Brother Dave will do it. No, it's up to you and me. If you can do it, you do it. There is no one else that could do it. This should really stand out and challenge us today. Jesus told his disciples that they should feed the crowd. He didn't say, don't worry, I'll take this over. No, he didn't say that. He said, you feed them. For Jesus, it was rather simple. There was a large group of hungry people. <laughs> uh, uh, you, ever heard the, you ever heard the Campbell Soup commercial? Uh, hungry? <laughs> These men were hungry. And Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. There was a need. What do you need? You meet the need. This is what ex is expected in the kingdom of God. See, the church is never meant to be a country club where all we do is entertain ourselves. We are here to have our eyes open to the needs of the people in our community, and we are to have a willingness to meet those needs. Our starting point is not to be what our resources are. Amen. But rather, what is the need? 
let me share something with you that, that is so profound in the life of our church. We're, we're not this big church that uh, has a warehouse space uh, like a lot of these feeding organizations. But when people call 211, Brother Phil, guess where they are led to first? Right here. They are led right here. And listen, when people come and they have a need, what's our need? Meet the needs. And that's what we are to do. Let's meet the needs with the help of Christ. We are not alone. We are co-laborers. That means we're all in this together. Amen. And although we need to start with the needs, at some point, we have to deal with the limited resources. And even if the disciples had taken the initiative, they would have acknowledged that there was only five loaves and two fish. However, limited resources are not the end of this story. One of the lessons of this narrative is limited resources, Brother Larry, plus Jesus equals more than enough. He is more than able. Yes, yes, he is more than able. The disciples were never expected to feed the crowd in their own power. We as a church are never expected to minister to our community in our own power. We need to look at our limited people, money, time, or whatever resource and invite Jesus uh, to multiply it. If that sounds too spiritual for you, we need to remember that Jesus had done many things in the past in this church for us to continue to do what we do. Amen. All we can do is bring what we have and present it to Jesus. And once our limited resources are put into the hands of Jesus, listen, anything is possible. Other seeds fell into good soil, and they grew up and what? Increased. They yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, 100 fold. God asked us to do the impossible, and then he gives us whatever we need to obey his command. The reality is, believers, as believers, we have stopped believing in the impossible. That's what we do. We serve a big God. How many of you believe in a big God? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Both our hands should be up. And if our feet could raise up, our feet should be raised up. Yeah. Amen. The reason why we are limited is because of our mindset. We say, we, we look at what's in front of us, and then we have no faith. And God says, if you have little faith, I'm going to give you little. But if you have big, listen, nothing is impossible to God. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. The word for believes is a participle that literally translates as the believing one. Jesus provides the means for everything to be possible. But you must believe, though. Faith without works is what? Dead. Right? If we misunderstand the statement that all things are possible to him who believes, then what we are doing is setting ourselves up for disappointment. Jesus' words are not a promise that we can do whatever we want, but rather he makes it clear that the believing one has the power only due to whom he believes in, namely Jesus, the Son of God. There's power in God's name. And it's access through faith and prayer according to his will. Let me show you some events in Scripture. 
that Jesus often told people to do the impossible. John chapter 5, he told the lame man, rise, take up your bed and walk. And this man had been sitting by this pool for 38 years. That means, that tells me that whatever you're going through in your life, uh, 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 it doesn't matter. How long you've been going through it doesn't matter. God says, rise, take up your bed and walk. To the le ten lepers, he said, go show yourself to the priest. To the dead man, he cried out, Lazarus, come forth. If he would have just said, come forth, everybody would have came forth. There's a sense in which every command of God is impossible for us to obey. We always lack what we need to obey God's command. But God is faithful to give us Whatever we need when we ask. We have not because we ask not. What God demands, he supplies. He's not just going to see a good company manager, a good leader, good HR department, <laughs> right? When they hire you for your job, what do they give you? A handbook. Right? And that handbook spells out everything that is expected of you. And then once they give you a handbook, uh, they, they, they give you some tools, prayerfully, amen, that you need in order to successfully do your job on a daily basis. He bids us fly. God says fly. I'll give you the wings. Amen. Here's a well-known fact that most of the Fortune 500 companies in the world today actually started in a garage or a basement. I learned that Google's, whose, whose net worth is $253 billion, was started in the garage of a house. Jesus instructed the disciples to find out how many loaves they had. And they returned with five loaves and two fishes. The demand surely exceeded the supply, right? It succeeded the supply with this little boy sack lunch. Because that's what it was. Amen. If you read, your, read the text, that's what it was. We find Jesus feeding 5,000 plus people. This is indeed a very common pattern in the Bible to take a little and make much. Exodus 3, 13, the Lord asked Moses, what's in your hand? Moses said, it's my staff. God anointed the staff and Moses could perform miracles with that staff. In 1 Kings 17, the widow in Zarephath had only a handful of flour and a little cooking oil, and God blessed these, and the widow never ran short. In a couple of weeks, we're going to deal with 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, Elijah asked the widow, what do you have? And the widow said, nothing but some olive oil. God blessed that, and the rest is history. Anointing comes onto what you already have. Never feel sorry when your resources are insufficient or, the, or they're not the latest and the best. God is perfectly capable of anointing what you have and expanding the little things if you would just let him use them. The feeding of the 5,000 is that Jesus often uses other people to bless other people. Jesus asked his disciples to go and find food, and they found a boy with five loaves and two fishes. And in that moment, Jesus uses the boy for his miracle and turned those five loaves and two fish into something the crowd would be enriched and fed. And listen, here's how powerful God is. When, the, when, when they were all filled and satisfied, amen, there was 12 baskets of fragments. The scenario teaches two, two things about Jesus. The first thing it teaches 
is that he uses others, his disciples in this case, to be his hands providing blessings to others. Lehigh Valley, he's using us. He wants to use us. Amen. But what happens? What needs to happen? We all, A-L-L, <laughs> need to be involved. He asked them to find food, which they did by finding the little boy in his sack lunch. Secondly, Jesus uses his children to help others. He often uh, encourages a simple boy to help a crowd of 5,000 through the five loaves of bread and two fishes. This boy was hungry just like everybody else was hungry. Amen. He gives up his lunch, and he's probably thinking, I got to give up my lunch that my mother took time to prepare for me. Can we just imagine what amazement the boy had when his simple treasures become the reason for this whole crowd to be fed? Amen. And by Jesus using the disciples and the boy to bless others, we are reminded that God will use us to bless others as well. There are many times when we are asked by God to help people in need. And this is similar to the very scenario that happened during the feeding of the 5,000. When God asks us to be a blessing to others, listen, we must have And just do it. When God asks you to do something, don't be like our children. Why? 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 Just do it. Because you never know that what you do can be an impact on so many other lives. And can I tell you today that Jesus is big enough for any expectation? Here, he surpasses expectation. He is the ultimate. This means that Jesus provides every, for every need, and he extends. But my God shall do what? Supply what? All my needs according to the what? Riches in his glory by Christ Jesus. Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 is a general reminder to our daily Christians' lives that nothing we face, nothing is too big for God. Listen, he's enough. Jesus is enough for any of our expectation. And he often will use others to bless us. And ultimately, it shows the compassion of Jesus for his people. And through this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, we are reassured of Jesus' love for us. One author wrote, I remind you that every miracle begin on the platform of a problem. I dare you to find a miracle that did not begin in a problem. If we could ever see that, we would have an entirely different attitude towards our problem. Look at the first miracle in John chapter 2. What happened? They ran out of wine. So Jesus says, oh, there's no better time for me to demonstrate who I am. So he says there were six water pots, and these water pots were generally for ceremonial washings. And he told, and he told the, the people that worked there, he said, go get them water pots. The problem wasn't the water, Jesus. The problem is wine. He says, I want you to put so much water in there, and I wanted, I wanted so much in there that nothing else could fit. And that says to me that we need to present ourselves as empty water pots. The problem was that they ran out of wine. But Jesus worked a miracle, didn't he? I explained to you John chapter 5, the man that sat by the pool. That was a problem. Jesus turned it into a miracle. And problems are those situations, listen, they're engineered of God to bring us face to face with our deficiencies so that we might view his sufficiency as our only alternative. See, when you're going through something, stop turning on the TV. Stop Stop scrolling the internet and just get on your knees and pray. 
we should learn. Now, I'm going to say something that you're going to go home and say, Brother Bean, you must be out of your mind. We should learn to love our problems. Amen. Every problem is an opportunity to trust the Lord and to watch him step into our circumstances for his glory. You have a problem today? Good. Amen. God can solve your problem. God can take our problem and then he can turn it into a blessing beyond our imagination. So what do I need to do today? I need to go out. Somebody say go out and feed somebody. Amen. Amen. That's what we need to do. And watch God work. See, don't worry about what you have. Take what you have and watch God work. And that's what he can do. He can take our, our 70, our 80, our 90, right? And turn it into 100-fold, 200-fold, 300-fold. Am I right, Brother Rain? Yes. He can do that. Don't worry about that. Just watch God work. He's going to take Brother Dave, he's going to put him in a new community, and he's going to allow Dave to go out and feed somebody, and, and he's going to bless Brother Dave's work. And Dave's going to call us and say, uh, Brother Bean, uh, uh, he said, uh, uh, I've been working on this and that, and God has multiplied, and that's an extension of us. Amen. So play, take Mark chapter 6, verse 32 through 44 in your personal time with the Lord, God will bless us tremendously if we all get involved in the work. God may be holding black back blessings upon us because we're not all involved. So let's get involved. There's enough work to be done. God has gifted people in this congregation all of us are gifted. And God, I may ask you to do something in this congregation. It's because God has given me the eyes to see something unique in you. To use it for the glory of his kingdom. Don't run from it. Amen. Do it for the glory of God. Each of us are unique in our own way. We need eyes. We need uh, feet, amen. <laughs> we need toes. We also need people with heart, with nerves, right? Those things that, uh, that you don't see that uh, uh, it, it would, if they begin to misfunction, then we really know something is wrong with the body. All of us fit into this, and we all have to play a role in going out and feeding other people. And when I say feed, I'm not just talking about from a physical standpoint. I'm also talking spiritually. Amen. Sometimes we have people that have mental health needs. Sometimes we have people that need encouragement. Uh, uh, there are many things that this church has, and the resources are here. And he's telling you and me, just go out and feed somebody. Get involved. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, how do I become a Christian on today? I'm so glad you asked that question. I'm going to give you the plan of salvation even right now. You hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, Hebrews 11 and 6. You repent of your sins. What is that? Repentance is a change of mind that says no to sin and yes to God. No to my ways and yes to the ways of God. You confess Jesus Christ to be the son of God. Uh, we just ask you to do that verbally with your mouth. You say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. We'll baptize you today for the remission of sins. What is baptism? It's a reenacting of the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Just like Jesus on his way to the cross, he died on that old rugged cross. They buried him. But that wasn't the end of the story. He resurrected. In your obedience to that on today, you will die. We will bury you in the liquid grave of baptism. 
you'll come out resurrected to live a new life in Jesus Christ. Listen, that's how you become a Christian on today. And if you need the prayers of the church, listen to me. Do not leave here today. And you have been, uh, something has been in your spirit all week since we've last met. And you need the church to pray for you. I've been struggling, preacher. I've been struggling, saints of God. Then we are here to pray for you. This is a no judgment zone. This is the hospital. This is the spiritual Lehigh Valley a hospital. This is the spiritual St. Luke's. Amen. When you need healing, you go to your doctor. We put, more, uh, we put more into our physical than we do our spiritual. But listen, we're here for you today. We want to connect with you. We want to pray for you. Why? James says it this way. The effectual fervent prayers of the righteous avails much. There's enough righteous people in this room to get a prayer up to God. Amen? Amen. So if you need to become a Christian on today, don't leave here the same way you came in. You can walk out of here. A new, a new Christian in Christ Jesus. If you need prayer, it's not too late to fill out a prayer card. As together we stand and sing.